So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly a great pleasure to be here, and it's a tremendous honor to be here. And uh, Bill Fife is certainly a brilliant man. And uh, for me, it's a particular honor to be here today giving this, this presentation. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Fred. I don't remember that day in your office, uh, but I'm glad things worked out so well for you at Western Ontario. <laughs> It's a lot to be said for, for persevering. Um, so today I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, look back at, uh, at the Garden of Eden. And uh, I'm not going to deal with the question whether or not there was a Garden of Eden. Uh, there are other people on campus and other departments who are uh, better qualified to answer that issue. But what I want to do is try to imagine what it was like in the past as regards air, as regards water. And I will do that using uh, peat bogs and using uh, polar, polar ice. And I want to start off with uh, this paper that was published in, in Science 1981 from Bill Fife. 1981 is when I came to the University of Western Ontario. Environmental Crisis Quantifying Geosphere Interactions. And this was a profound paper in the sense that Bill Fife was explaining to us that human activities are affecting geo uh, uh, environmental uh, processes on a, on a global scale. And he included this table, and it was the total mobilization of metals from the continents into the oceans. And he was arguing that uh, human activities are on the same scale as a bunch of geological processes. and. Uh, I think this paper, I've been thinking about it ever since, and uh, I thought about the profound implications and uh, drew a lot of inspiration from this. And of course, as a scientist, we look at everything with some degree of skepticism, and one of the things that I needed to do was to actually quantify some of these processes for my, myself. So as I said, whether or not there was a Garden of Eden, for me that is secondary. What I want to do is simply ask the question, what was the atmosphere like in the past? And uh, of course, a lot of information today about our atmosphere in the past we're getting from ice cores. And this is a, a graph that most of you will be familiar with. In the red we see temperature, in the blue we see CO2 concentrations. This is reconstructed from ice cores from Antarctica, and it's a record of atmospheric CO2 for the past 650,000 years. And you can see there's variations. There's glacial periods, interglacial periods, warm phases, cold phases, and you can also see that CO2 are, va are varying in, in sync. I want to point out to you that the carbon dioxide concentrations during this period never exceeded 300 parts per million, and today we're about 380 parts per million and, and rising. So ice cores are very valuable archives of atmospheric change. And uh, most of the work that's coming out on the ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica is uh, from the group of Professor Thomas Stoker at the University of Bern. And it's amazing how Bern, together with Grenoble, and Heidelberg have really become world leaders in this area. So a lot of our basic information about understanding global climate, uh, at least for the past many glacial cycles, are coming from these, these ice cores. But it turns out that peat bogs are also excellent archives. And uh, so bogs are accumulations of fossil organic material, and they're also excellent archives of an environmental change. And uh, it's amazing what you can find in bogs in, in Europe. The Tolland man was thrown into a bog during the Iron Age, so about a thousand years before, before Christ, and perfectly preserved because of the anoxic conditions. And it's amazing the number of artifacts that have been found throughout Europe, the silver vase going back to the Iron Age, this Roman statue, remains of Irish elk. Amazing things have been found in peat bogs they're very valuable archives of, of archaeology and human history and also environmental change. Nearly a hundred years <clears throat> has been invested in looking at vegetation uh, history and changes in vegetation 
using uh, peat cores from throughout Europe and many other parts of the world. A big part of it is done using pollen grains, reconstructing uh, vegetation history using the, the grains that are released by, by tree pollen and, and using peat bogs to reconstruct climate. And uh, this is a reconstruction of summer temperatures for the past 13,000 years, reconstructed using bogs. And I simply want to point out to you the so-called climate optimum, which was between, between approximately 4,000 and perhaps 8,000 years ago, the middle of the Holocene. The Holocene is the past 10,000 years, and you can see that there was a climate optimum in the middle of that. And I will come back to that, as well as this cold climate phase about 10,000 years ago, known as the Younger, younger Dryas. So amazing amount of climate information that we can get out of our, our peat bogs. But what I want to show you today is that peat bogs are also excellent archives of a broad range of potentially toxic metals and also lithogenic metals that are important indicators of soil dust deposition and, and climate change. So we can reconstruct the ch changing rates and sources of atmospheric dusts, whether they're soil-derived dust particles or volcanic ash, but also fallout radionuclides and even persistent organic pollutants. So bogs are amazing archives of a, of a range of things, at least that's what I will try to convince you of, of today. And of course, the ice cores, as I said, these are our supreme archives of, of atmospheric change. We've been looking at trace metals in the ice cores to compare with our peat bogs, and I'll provide you with an introduction to that. So again, what I'm going to try to do for you today is to try to reconstruct what the atmosphere was like in the past, but I also wonder about water that we were drinking in the past, and what was this water like? So I'm going to take you today to my favorite river, which is the Hollow River in Dorset, Ontario, to have a look at the lead that's dissolved in the water here, and also Quagma Lake at Dorset, again, my favorite lake. And you'll see why I love this, this lake so much. And finally, I'll take you to some groundwaters, and my favorite groundwaters in the world are in Elmvale, Ontario. Okay, so I've been wrestling with this question as a successor to the paper by Bill Fife is a paper by Jerome Riagu, Heavy Metals, Are We Poisoning the, the Biosphere? Now, metals in the environment come not only from human activities, but every earth scientist knows also from atmospheric soil dusts, also from volcanic emissions. And our job is to distinguish between natural and anthropogenic sources. And what I want to focus on today are the calcophile elements, the elements that are highly enriched in, in metal sulfides, okay? And there's a small group of these with no physiological function. So I focus on a really small group of elements, things like silver, cadmium, antimony, arsenic, lead, mercury, thallium, because they have no physiological function function, they cannot be beneficial under any circumstances. And scandium is another favorite element because it has nothing at all to do with human activities. Total global scandium production is 45 kilos. We've not yet found a use for scandium, and I hope we never do. Okay, so I want to start with a look at lead in, in peat bogs. The most important concept to understand about a bog is that the metals are coming only from the atmosphere. Okay, so a bog is detached from the local watershed and receives nutrients, metals, exclusively from the atmosphere. And we've been looking at bogs in different parts of Europe. My favorite bog in the world is a tiny little peat bog in Switzerland. Okay, and it's called Etang de la Gruyere. It's only 20 hectares. It's a tiny little bog. And on this little half island, we have six and a half meters of peat, which has accumulated during the past 15,000 years. So we have the longest continuous peat accumulation of, uh, of any European bog. And this is a summary of our work on, on atmospheric lead. And it's a summary of lead in the atmosphere for the past 15,000 years. 
And I want to start on the left-hand side of this diagram with our lead enrichment factor. It's simply the lead scandium ratio in our peat compared to our background value. And it tells you the extent to which lead was enriched in, in aerosols or atmospheric particles. And the point that I wish to make here is very simply, until 3,000 years ago, there was no enrichment. That's point number one. Point number two, since 3,000 years ago, we have a continuous enrichment of lead in the atmosphere. We see lead contamination from the time of the Phoenicians approximately 3,000 years ago, from Roman lead mining, from lead mining in medieval Germany, from the Industrial Revolution, the introduction in leaded gasoline. So my point here is simply that our lead enrichment factor shows that human activities have completely dominated atmospheric lead continuously for 3,000 years. Now, on the right-hand side, we see T206 lead, 207 lead. These are two stable isotopes of lead that we use to fingerprint the source of the lead. And please notice that the ratio was approximately 1.2 until 3,000 years ago. 1.2 is also the ratio of the Earth's crust, and of course the soils derived from the crust and this is telling us that natural lead in the atmosphere until 3,000 years ago was more or less exclusively soil dust particles. But since 3,000 years ago, we have lower lead isotope ratios and lower lead isotope ratios are found in lead sulfide minerals. And this is our independent indication that our atmospheric lead is now being uh, dominated by industrial lead from smelting uh, and beginning approximately 3,000 years ago. Okay, so the story of environmental lead contamination didn't begin with gasoline lead. That was just the latest chapter. We had lots of a lead, lead emitted during the Industrial Revolution. We had lots of lead emitted in Germany during the medieval period. We had lots of lead emitted to the atmosphere during the Roman period. And then the Phoenicians were trading from the Middle East to Spain in lead ores 3,000 years ago. And we have independent confirmation of this from our studies of marine sediments from the Mediterranean. Okay, so we can actually use our bog to calculate the rate of lead deposition or our lead flux and we use scandium to calculate the dust flux. So scandium is an indicator of the amount of dust that we have. And I want to draw your attention to our lowest levels of dust deposition and the lowest levels of lead deposition are this period during the middle Holocene. So this is the climate optimum when we had our largest extent of vegetation at the surface of the earth and the lowest fluxes of dust to the atmosphere. And it shows us the connection between climate and atmospheric trace metals. Now, there's a big peak in our dust flux and a big peak in lead flux, a corresponding peak, and that's our younger dryas, our cold climate phase, less vegetation, stronger winds, more soil dust particles. So again, we see the connection between lead and climate change and we see that our lead in the atmosphere was controlled by soil dust particles. Now notice approximately 6,000 years ago, we have an increase in lead and an increase in dust deposition. Two things were happening here, drying of the Sahara and deforestation, the beginning of agriculture in Switzerland. And to me, this is when we left the Garden of Eden. Deforesting Switzerland increasing in erosion and release of soil dusts to the atmosphere. So you can see we've affected atmospheric change going back at least 6,000 6, years. One of the applications of this work, <clears throat> if we wanted to look at the impact of a particular source of contamination, uh, here we have a zinc smelter in, in Flin Flon, Manitoba. Flin Flon is up here. About 90 kilometers away, we have a peat bog at Sask Lake, and we can collect a peat core from this bog to document the change in atmospheric metal emissions from this smelter. And we see this here. 
This is 210 lead, which is used as age dating. You can see this is 1800, 200 years ago. We have very low lead concentrations, and this is the isotopic composition of our lead. And then in 1930, we have the opening of our smelter. We have an increase in lead concentrations, reaching a maximum in the 60s, completely different isotopic composition. So it turns out that bogs are outstanding archives of atmospheric lead, and we're now in the position where we can do detailed reconstructions of, of atmospheric lead. But we've also been working on antimony, and antimony is also a calcophile found in metal sulfides. It's also been used for a long time. It's mentioned in the Bible. We've certainly been using it for at least 5,000 years. And this glass fish that's approximately 3,500 years old, this yellow color here is lead antimonate, which is known to the painters of the Renaissance as Naples yellow, produced to produce this, this pigment here. Antimony was also used in medicine, except at the University of Heidelberg, where in 1566, the medical students had to swear an oath that they would never use antimony because of the risks, risks of, of poisoning. It has been used in poisoning along with arsenic, mercury, and lead, which is described in this book by John, John Emsley. The main use is today antimony trioxide is used as a flame retardant. Textiles and plastics. Antimony sulfide is, in, is used in auto brake pads. So unless you're driving a Porsche, which uses a ceramic brake pad, then every time you hit the brakes, you're releasing little particles containing antimony to the atmosphere. And antimony trioxide is also the catalyst used to make PET bottles. If we go to some remote peat bogs in northwestern Scotland, and also the Shetland Islands, and we look at the distribution of antimony, we see that it's primarily anthropogenic antimony, even in the most remote parts of Europe. And if we look at the distribution of antimony, it actually resembles the distribution of lead. Why is that? Because antimony is the trace element most commonly enriched in lead sulfide minerals. So when we're mining and smelting lead sulfides, we're not only emitting lead to the atmosphere, but also antimony. We've also worked on mercury, and our work on mercury took us to the Faroe Islands. In the Faroe Islands, they have a problem where the children, their neurological development has been impacted by, by mercury. And uh, the, the, in, the effect of the, the mercury has been very well documented on the, on the development of these children. And our question was, how much mercury is coming naturally to the Faroe Islands simply from volcanic emissions from, from Iceland. So there is peat on the Faroe Islands, and we went there and collected a core to determine how much of the mercury in the peat is natural and how much is anthropogenic. But there's a problem with mercury. Lead, we saw in the atmosphere, naturally is mainly in the form of dust particles. Mercury in the atmosphere is gaseous elemental mercury. It has nothing at all to do with dust. So the question is, what do we use for a reference element? We can't use scandium. We thought we would try to use bromine, and bromine as bromide comes mainly from the oceans, from marine aerosols, has nothing to do with, with dust particles. And the question is, was the mercury bromine ratio in the peat constant in the past? Selenium also comes from marine aerosols and our question is, is the mercury to selenium ratio constant in the past? So here, for us to understand mercury, we need a reference element. And it turns out that the mercury bromine ratio, the mercury selenium ratio, in fact, were constant for thousands of years. So what does this mean? We can now calculate the natural amount of mercury in a peat sample using simply the bromine concentration and this natural ratio of mercury to bromine, we can do the same thing using selenium. So the math is very, very simple. So here's our calculation of natural mercury using bromine 
natural mercury using selenium, now we can calculate anthropogenic mercury. It's the total minus the natural. And if we do that, we see that there was no anthropogenic mercury in the Faroe Islands until approximately a thousand years ago. Then it begins to increase and notice reaching a maximum in 1954. Okay, we dated this peat core using 210 lead and also the bomb pulse of 14C. Fascinating, if we look at lead in that same bog, we see lots of natural lead because of volcanic ash, but anthropogenic lead, which is the total minus lithogenic, we see a remarkable peak in lead, which is also in 1954. So we not only have our maximum in mercury, but we have our maximum in lead. And that suggests to us that they have a common source. We also see atmospheric uh, lead contamination from the Roman period, and by the way, also antimony from the Roman period. If we look at our lead isotopes again, 206, 207, 206, uh, 208, 206, our peat samples with the most lead are nothing to do with sediments, nothing to do with gasoline lead, but they're a very good match for coal from the UK. Okay, so this is an indication we have our maximum enrichment of mercury and lead. It tells us that they have a common source and the lead isotopes telling us that that was coal. So here we're using lead and lead isotopes to understand mercury. Sheffield, England, on a non-working day during the 1920s, same view 24 hours later. This is what it was like in the air before the introduction of air pollution control technologies beginning in England. I believe it was uh, the Clean Air Act of 1956. Mercury has also taken us to the Arctic, and in the Arctic, our problem here as Canadians that many members of the native population have elevated mercury and elevated concentrations of organic contaminants in their, in their food supply. So what is the problem with mercury in the Arctic? The problem is the bacterial methylation of mercury. So the concentrations of ionic mercury in the water, extremely low, but bacteria will methylate it and it goes from becoming slightly water soluble to fat soluble, it gets enriched in the food chain. And the enrichment factor, I'm sorry, the enrichment factor is on the order of one million times. So we went to the high Arctic of Canada to collect some peat to reconstruct the natural rate of atmospheric mercury deposition. And this is us collecting peat. We had to make specialized coring equipment. This is frozen peat. There's approximately 5,000 years of frozen peat in the high Arctic of Canada. And then we use that to reconstruct atmospheric mercury. These are the bogs that we've been studying worldwide. And those arrows show you the bogs where we've reconstructed the rates of atmospheric mercury deposition. And remarkably, we have a really constant natural background rate of atmospheric mercury deposition. In Switzerland, in the Faroe Islands, in the high Arctic of Canada, about one microgram per square meter per year. And this tells us that we've overestimated our natural emissions of mercury to the atmosphere, and we've underestimated the effect of human activities on the global mercury cycle. Now you're probably wondering what about our beautiful little Sifton bog here in the city of London, Ontario. Here's the mercury concentration profile in Sifton. Notice it also has a maximum in the 1950s. And so do several other peat bogs here in Ontario. Okay, the maximum rate of atmospheric mercury uh, deposition in Sifton in the, in the 1950s was probably about 100 times above the natural level. And by the way, those three peat bogs not only have the same chronology of atmospheric mercury, but also atmospheric lead, which again tells us coal was, a, was the main source. Here's, here's a maximum lead in Sifton in the 19, late 1950s. Thallium, silver, and cadmium. This is the problem when you start with the periodic table. Every element is fascinating, okay? But we don't have that much time. I have to summarize. Amazing thing about thallium, if we look at its 
concentration in our peat samples for thousands of years, it follows scandium perfectly. It can be explained easily by soil dust, but if we look at silver, or if we look at cadmium, it's absolutely remarkable during the middle of the Holocene, during the Holocene climate optimum, we have our highest enrichments of silver and cadmium. They have nothing at all to do with atmospheric soil dust. Completely different story, which we don't understand, but we're working on it. Lithophile elements, conservative things, are things that um, don't go into the aqueous phase. They remain behind in the solid phase. Titanium follow scandium, we can use titanium to reconstruct the changing rates of dust deposition. And again, during the middle Holocene, we've now started to actually look at the mineralogy of these dusts. And we can see that these are mainly the sorts of minerals that we find in our soils derived from the weathering of rocks. Okay, and again, our lowest rates of dust deposition during the middle of the Holocene. But fascinating, if we calculate an enrichment factor for titanium or zirconium, in fact, we see that they're not constant and there's periods of change and there's periods when these elements are strongly enriched. And this is probably an indication of enrichment of heavy minerals and an enrichment of heavy minerals tells us stronger winds or a changing source area, which is climate change. So in fact, elements like titanium and zirconium that have nothing to do with human activities in our bog can be used to help us reconstruct uh, Holocene climate, climate change. We're also using rare earths to trace the predominant sources of our dusts and most recently using strontium isotopes. And this is an example from the southernmost southern hemisphere. We went there to evaluate our hypothesis that natural lead in the atmosphere was de derived exclusively from soil dusts, which it is, but we've also used the strontium isotopes to distinguish between our background soil-derived aerosols and our volcanic aerosols to reconstruct the changing sources of, of dust to Antarctica. Arsenic, fascinating element. We looked at three sites in Finland, a background site, a copper mine, and a copper nickel smelter. And we can see an increase in arsenic concentration at our background site about a thousand years ago. When lead began to increase in the atmosphere, so too did arsenic. And this is probably from our lead mining in Germany during the medieval period. The analytical chemistry of arsenic far more complicated. Here it's important to de determine the abundance of individual species. So we connect an HPLC to the ICPMS to do arsenic speciation. And these are two of the species that we've identified in the peat. These are organic forms, which are much less toxic than the, the inorganic forms. Our bogs are also excellent archives of fallout radionuclides. Here's our gamma spectrometer, and here's a peat sample from London, Ontario, from approximately 1960, and you see this 241 americium and 137 cesium, they're from atom bomb testing. Okay, so our bog is also an archive of, of the fallout of various radionuclides. Persistent organic contaminants, it's not my area, I'm a, I'm a guy who works on, on metals, but we have done some work and we can actually see that the bog also provides us with a record of the changing flux, fluxes of uh, PCBs in the atmosphere. So the bogs are really amazing, amazing archives. Unfortunately, they've had a really bad rap somehow. Uh, Shakespeare, he must have had a bad bog experience. Those that ride not warily fall into foul bogs. In fact, what we're finding is they are really amazing archives and probably our best continental archives of many aspects of environmental change. And they're also very beautiful. I should also mention this. This is from New Zealand for, uh, for Bill Fife, that bogs are very important carbon reservoirs and they've been removing CO2 from the atmosphere for a long time. 
This is a tropical peat swamp in Indonesia, and this is what it looks like after it's deforested and drained and planted to date palm. So we're certainly losing uh, uh, large extents of, of peatlands worldwide. If you want to learn more about bogs, David Suzuki did a beautiful film, The Hidden World of the Bog, and on that film we have an interview with, uh, with Bill Fife. I'd like to move on to the snow and ice archives. We know that these ice cores are excellent archives of environmental change. As regards trace metals, they're very problematic because the metal concentrations, number one, are so low. Number two, the risk of contamination is so high. So you have to work in extremely clean lab environments. And we started a collaboration with James Zheng at the Geological Survey of Canada looking at an ice core from Devon, Devon Island. And James has just been a pleasure to work with. He's helped to develop this titanium core for collecting the samples. But even though there's less contamination than conventional cores, the ice samples are completely contaminated with lead. So he takes them into his clean lab at minus 18 degrees and decontaminates them, okay? And then he brings the samples to the University of Heidelberg in Germany where we have built the world's most beautiful clean laboratory. This lab is a dream. We have class 10 conditions in our clean air cabinets. It's not only a clean lab, it's a metal-free clean lab. So we can work at, with very low uh, concentrations. The heart and soul is the ICPMS. With this machine, we can measure trace metals to lower levels probably than any other lab in the world. The acids that we use have to be distilled in quartz. They're distilled twice. And uh, with this equipment, we can measure all of the trace elements, and I really do mean all of them, as well as the lead isotope ratios. The, the laboratory not only has a heart and soul, it also has a brain. And that's Michael Krochler because these machines don't run themselves. This is lead and scandium going back in the ice core 16,000 years. Our background lead concentration, five parts per trillion. And I want you to remember that number because I'm going to come back to it two more times. But the cleanest layers of ancient Arctic ice five parts per trillion of lead. Now notice this huge peak in lead concentration. That's our younger dryas again. Big increase in lead, but it's proportional to scandium, okay, and it's soil dust particles because of climate change. When did atmospheric lead contamination begin in the Arctic of Canada? I can tell you it began 3,000 years ago when we have our first significant enrichment in lead and we have our first significant decline in the lead isotope ratio. So remember I showed you in Switzerland atmospheric lead contamination beginning 3,000 years ago? That reached the Arctic of Canada. And we see the effect of the Romans and we also see the effect of the Germans during the medieval period. And by the way, the same is true for all of the other calcophile elements. Okay, so I know we like to think of it as the Great White North, and we can continue to think about it that way, but there's traces of atmospheric contamination by heavy metals going back 3,000 years. This is beautiful evidence of long-range atmospheric transport of aerosols. Fascinating, if we look at the past 160 years, let's look at lead, which is shown here in green relative to scandium, and we can see it's gone into decline during the past decades. This is beautiful. This is because of the introduction of unleaded gasoline. Fantastic. Scandium has gone in the, or, sorry, antimony has gone in the opposite direction. So antimony in the Arctic of Canada, the enrichment has been increasing during the past decades. One of the reasons why antimony is so fascinating. Antimony is the most highly enriched trace element and urban aerosols today, if we look at a city like Tokyo in the fine fraction, less than 2.5 microns, we see antimony enrichment factors of 20,000 times. So antimony highly enriched in, uh, in aerosols in urban areas. Our brake pads, but also incineration of these antimony containing textiles. 
Okay, so I said I was going to say something about air. I want to move on to water. Because these people were not only breathing air, they were also drinking water. And I'm really curious about what they were actually drinking. So I want to look at lead in surface waters. And my question here is, we've contaminated our atmosphere with lead. Is it going to stay in the soil or is it going to slowly leach out? Okay, so my favorite lake in the world is Kawagama Lake. And we know from our peat bogs in the area, we have about one gram of industrial lead per square meter in this area. It's a beautiful lake. Kawagama means lake of many sounds. It's beautiful by day, it's beautiful by night. I have simply gone around the lake collecting stream water samples to compare with water samples from the middle of the lake but I use the same clean lab methods that we use for the ice cores. Now the beauty of this area, here's our metamorphic rock, 1.4 billion years old. This is the isotopic composition of the lead in that rock, and our lead is mainly in biotite and potassium feldspar. This must be the lead isotope ratio, we've not measured it. It's based on the age of the rock. So natural lead in the water will have this isotope ratio. But if we look at the isotope ratios that we find, the natural value 1.238, 1.24, we find significantly lower values. Very reproducible, okay, but in the middle of the lake, extremely low lead isotope ratios. And this is fascinating. If we look at our lead concentrations, the streams that come into the lake have quite high lead whether it's the bulk water sample or whether it's the dissolved water, our streams are coming in with high lead concentrations. But look at the middle of the lake, 10 parts per trillion. That's only a factor of two higher than in the ancient ice, which tells us if we need extreme precautions to measure lead in ancient ice, we also need extreme lead, uh, precautions to measure lead in the water. Fascinating, I go up here in the winter and collect snow. The snow today is very highly enriched in lead. But the surface waters in the lake are actually quite low. So we can actually see how the lead is being removed simply by removal of particles. Okay, so here's our estimated bedrock value in our 206, 207, and here's our streams. But this line here is our leaded gasoline value from Canada 1.15. But if you look at the values from the middle of the lake, they don't match the leaded gasoline value. They're actually significantly lower. How do you explain the isotopic composition of lead in the middle of the lake? If you look at these arrows here, these are the values of aerosols in Dorset measured in the 80s when the air was coming from northern Ontario and northern Quebec. Okay, so we go to our peat bog now, and in blue is our lead concentration, and in red is our lead isotope ratio. And 200 years ago, the lead isotope ratio is exactly what we expected it should be. Okay, here's the introduction of leaded gasoline in North America in 1923. And here's the introduction of unleaded gasoline, which in Canada was 1976. So with the introduction of unleaded gasoline, our lead isotope ratios should now be moving back to natural values. But they don't do that. They're going in the opposite direction. Why are they doing that? The lead isotope ratios of our massive sulfides, our copper and nickel sulfides, northern Ontario, northern Quebec, have an extremely low lead isotope ratio. We get rid of the leaded gasoline, and now proportionately more lead is coming from our smelters. And we see that in the middle of our lake, and we see that in our peat bog. So fascinating on our, on our surface waters, the lead is mainly industrial, but the concentration in the lake is extremely low. It's important to understand that. And just to be absolutely sure, we've completely redone the entire study using a remote lake in Algonquin Park. It's the same study, or same, same result. 
Okay, I want to move on now to groundwater. <clears throat> and uh, I told you that my favorite groundwater in the world is in Springwater Township. And what a great name for a place that has our abundant artesian flows. And uh, this area has received some controversy lately because Simcoe County had proposed to build a landfill on top of one of these artesian flows. And I asked a very simple question, what is the chemical composition of the water today before they build the landfill? Um, I can let you know that due to public pressure, the idea of the landfill was completely shut down indefinitely in September. And as part of my tenure as the WS Fife uh, scientist in residence in September, I'll be organizing a symposium here at the University of Western Ontario about Site 41, not only a symposium, but I would like to develop this into a grad, uh, uh, case study for graduate, graduate students. Okay, so remember I said the cleanest layers of ancient Arctic ice had about five parts per trillion of lead. This groundwater, on average, has five parts per trillion of lead, but some of our groundwater is significantly less than one part per trillion of lead. To put that into perspective, this is among the lowest concentrations of lead ever measured at the surface of the Earth. Okay? So I also now go out into this area collecting snow, and I look at the trace metals in the snow and their enrichment, and I compare that with the groundwater, and the amazing thing about the groundwater is that it's significantly depleted in a lot of these trace elements relative to the snow. And the key to understanding this is the soil. And by the way, this is a very young groundwater, less than 30 years old. So in fact, this is dirty rainwater from the 70s that has been filtered by Mother Nature. And by the way, Mother Nature is doing a remarkable job. This water is so clean, I've been working for five years on how to sample it and how to measure what's in it. So we've now created our own dedicated groundwater research well in stainless steel, and we've done a second one. This is high-density polyethylene that we cleaned in the clean lab in acid and have brought to Canada and installed. And now we're in the process of building a small clean laboratory so that when we sample our groundwater, that our water samples are not being contaminated by the air here in southern Ontario. Um, when I started looking at antimony in the groundwater, we found on average two parts per trillion. This is the first data on antimony in groundwater. There's no data because it's so low, nobody could measure it. But there was lots of data on bottled waters. I realized here something was going on we tested bottled waters from around the world and all of the bottled waters in plastic are all contaminated with antimony leaching from the PET. Somebody once said to me, okay, Bill, understand, I'll now drink bottled water only in glass. Bottled waters in glass are contaminated with lead leaching from the glass, okay? I am quite sure if there was a Garden of Eden, they weren't drinking bottled water. Fascinating thing about bottled waters, we've actually found quite a few brands of bottled water exceeding the uh, drinking water guideline for fluoride. Some exceed the drinking, guide, guideline, drinking water guideline for arsenic and for uranium. We have antimony leaching from the plastic, arsenic, lead, thorium leaching from the glass. We find elevated concentrations of things like silver, beryllium, and lithium in these waters. So to try to educate folks about water and about the environment, in 2007 I created the Elmville Water Festival. And this is a celebration of our water resources. Last year our speaker was Chris Wood, author of Dry Spring. Before that we had Maude Barlow. We've had a bunch of brilliant speakers including our very own Ron Martin from the University of Western Ontario. It's the first festival in human history where you can drink all you want for free all day. This is our official Elmvale Water Festival bottle, non-toxic, dishwasher safe, reusable polypropylene. And this is our official Elmvale Water Festival SIG bottle. Which we use for refreshment and none of this work in Elmvale 
could, would not be possible without my dear friend Mike Powell who's invested so much time and energy into helping with all of this. I also created the Elmville Foundation and the Elmville Foundation is a federally registered charity for environmental science education. If you want inf more information please go to elmvale.org. I have a personal connection to this, this particular area. My parents bought a farm property uh, near Elmville in, in 1972. And this is roughly what it looked like when they bought it. It's on the Wye River. And this is a very historic river here in Ontario because the first European settlement was built at the mouth of the Wye River in 1629, known as St. Marie among the Hurons. Well, Elmville gets its name from the elm tree but unfortunately they're nearly all gone for various reasons. And of course this entire area would have been clear cut in the mid 1800s. On our farm property they left one tree. The problem with cutting down all the trees along the river is erosion. So if we think about water quality we think about erosion and uh, cutting down all the trees beside the river was certainly a, a mistake. Franz Johnson, one of the founding members of the Group of Seven, did this painting in 1943, the farm stream. That's not what a stream is supposed to look like. Um, he had an art school in the area and he did many paintings of streams. That's what a stream is supposed to look like. So I've been planting trees at this farm property for more than 30 years. I'm guessing we've planted 25,000 trees. Uh, I didn't do it alone. I've had a lot of, lot of help over the years. And this is my own introduction to trying to restore a natural environment. And let me tell you, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. One challenge that I have is the beaver, okay? The beaver is over the moon about the tree planting. And I've had to find a way to get along with the beaver. And I have found a way to do that. I simply wanted to let you know it would have been a lot easier to leave those trees along the banks of the river. It's very hard to get them reestablished. I think that in our society in Canada, we undervalue trees. And it's fascinating. The societies, I find the societies that value trees are the societies that lost all of theirs. And this is an uh, olive tree in Montenegro. It's 2,000 years old. An olive tree in Montenegro cannot be bought, cannot be sold. No man can get married until he's planted at least one olive tree. And it's fascinating how deforestation of the Mediterranean changed the climate, changed the hydrology, and changed the soils completely. This is very well described in this book, Man and Nature, by George Perkins Marsh, was published in 1865. Okay, so I've tried to tell you what the air would have been like uh, in the past and, and also the water. And I've done that using our peat bogs, which are really remarkable archives, and also using our, using our ice cores. I want to leave you with just one thought. I've been talking about mathematical differences in enrichment. Think about the form of lead in the atmosphere in the past. It was soil, dust, particles, and for aerosols, these are quite large, between 20 and 100 microns. They're so small that we can't see them with the human eye, but they're large as far as a, an aerosol is concerned, which means they have a very short atmospheric lifetime because they're settling out of the atmosphere. But these are effectively insoluble and we can't breathe them in. So that lead was essentially biologically unavailable. Now think about the lead that's being re released from any combustion process, whether it's an automobile, a smelter, a coal-fired power station, an incinerator. These are sub-micron aerosols, mainly in the form of lead oxide, lead hydroxide, which is far more soluble, and we can respire these, we can breathe these deep into the lungs. So the quality of the air today and the quality of the air in the past was really, really very different. Okay, and just to emphasize that, here's some beach sand, here's a human hair, and that tiny little red dot is particulate matter less than two and a half microns. I don't know if there was a Garden of Eden, and I don't know if there was an ark. Um, 
But if there was an ark, and if there is going to be another ark, I think next time we may not get an invitation. I started uh, with my interest in Pete when I was at the University of Guelph. And in 1981, I came to the University of Western Ontario and I wanted to do a PhD and it had to be with Bill Fife. He had come to the University of Guelph, he had given a presentation and it, it just, talk about mind expanding, it was just unbelievable. I'd never before heard anything so brilliant. I had to go to Western, I had to do a PhD with Fife. I came to the University of Western Ontario and I said, I want to work on Pete. And Bill Fife said, fine, just do it. And that has made all the difference. And Bill, I am forever in your debt. I never would have thought that Boggs could be such amazing archives. And you provided me with that opportunity and I will always be grateful to you. And thank you very much for your attention.